Can everyone hear me out the back? Cool. All right. All right. Hi, I'm James. Um, I have many interesting hobbies, most of which probably apply to this conference conveniently. Um, if you get bored in the break and you'd like to talk to someone about making on-call better for humans, high availability and load balancing, mirroring free software, zero trust networking, home automation or hosting things in your garage or pretty much anything else, feel free to come and say hello. Um, so I'm from New Zealand. Cool. All right. So I work for Catalyst IT uh, in Wellington, New Zealand. I am a Linux sysadmin, network engineer, and recently became a people manager. Um, I'm on a team of sysadmins and network engineers, and we recently decided that having a large number of sysadmins casually working on software projects and then abandoning them as their projects shift was a bad idea, so we hired some developers and I managed those. So I run what we call the ops dev team for operational development. So I'm from here, Wellington, New Zealand, for those of you who don't know it or haven't been there before, highly recommend it. Uh, it's a bit different from being over here. Um, the entirety of New Zealand fits like that. And we almost have five million people, of which two million people live all the way at the top of that. So if you're ever coming to New Zealand, skip Auckland. You might have to fly through it, but go anywhere else and you'll be much happier. Um, I work in the Wellington office with about 200 other staff. It's the head of the company, but we have 350 people worldwide. Um, I spent the last week adjusting from the 12, 13 hour time zone difference in our Brighton office over in the UK. And yeah, When I'm not working, I'm a father and partner and homeowner now. But I'm here to talk to you today about hot potato. Um, so a few first things first. Uh, there are some photos in this talk that may upset some people who don't like earthquakes. I've specifically chosen ones that don't show anything too terrible and just damage to roading and infrastructure, because that's what I'm talking about. Um, so hopefully no one will get upset, but fair warning. All right. The other important thing to note is Hot Potato is not actually a monitoring system, uh, which is the biggest bit of confusion that people have. Um, we at Catalyst use Nargios 3, a single one, and a single two, depending on how long the customer's been around. And we are currently adding things like Prometheus and other bits into the mix, but Hot Potato is a message broker that takes things from your monitoring sources and makes sure they get to your on-call people. It's meant to deal with our 18 plus monitoring servers and us not having to make changes on every single one when someone's going away or similar. All right. So before we get too deep, I would like to tell you about life before Hot Potato at Catalyst. So when I started, which was almost five years ago now, we had the one pager team, referred to as the pager peeps. Um, every single person on the company had a pager, like the traditional old school brick that you carry around pager. Um, it was a single pager number with about 20 pages on it. So whichever one was turned on was getting the major notifications. Uh, we had a range of different monitoring builds. Um, some were customer managed, some were remote from us in places that were hard to get to or out of the country entirely. Uh, we had some in the US, some in the UK. Um, some countries could directly access the pager network, some couldn't, some used email to pager gateways. And it was generally a large amount of variety in how every different monitoring server was set up. When I started, we had the 18, running not just for a single one and a single two. And we also have a support hotline that's both business hours and 24-7, depending on your customer SLA, where in hours you call and you get a human and they talk to the on-call person, or out of hours, you call a number, you leave a voicemail message, and the pager wakes the person up. Um, we were doing IRC-based handovers, so you'd wake up in the morning after your pager shift, You'd go into the IRC channel, you'd say, hey, next person that's supposed to be on call, will you please hurry up and take the page or I'd like to go back to sleep? And it wasn't very pleasant for people. So why did we build it? Well, conveniently, because we were using pages, we already wanted a replacement system. Um, with our moving to a single two, we managed to get down to 16 different monitoring systems, but we still had 16 different monitoring systems. 
Um, the way we looked at what had recently paged was every monitoring server, when they paged, they sent an email to a shared mailbox, and that was our interface for seeing everything that had paged recently. Um, we had a number of single points of failure in the system, which was mostly the email gateways for the pages, and the messages that we got from monitoring systems weren't very consistent. So we already had a few problems that we wanted to solve. Mostly the aging technology in the pages system started getting worse. The pages started becoming unreliable. Um, this is a corrupt pager message which would happen multiple times a day. Um, pages were getting very, very expensive and it was only really being used by hospitals, um, emergency services and us, which tells you a lot. Um, this message actually says that our production Postgres server is down. Um, as you can see, it's, it's very useful. Um, the pages were also becoming quite old, and this one had a damaged connection between the LCD and the pager board itself um, after it got thrown at a wall. Um, and naturally, when I say we had modems to send pager messages, I mean modems with parallel ports and serial ports on the back that were becoming harder and harder to purchase. We actually bought two years ago, the last three in the country just before this next bit happened that I'm about to tell you about. Yeah, so we had screechy modems. Um, we were running out of replacements. We bought the last we bought the last three or four modems in the country, so there was one left in a warehouse somewhere. And they decided to throw it out after we bought the other three. So we kind of literally got the last three modems in the country. Um, Dial-up modems naturally use phone lines. Uh, this is a photo I took while I was on holiday down in Christchurch. Um, of some phone wirings that someone's put an ice cream cone on top of. Um, we had a problem in Wellington where Wellington's quite a rainy city, and naturally you can't rip up main streets of Wellington to you know, block traffic and roads and things to fix phone lines very easily. Um, so ours would periodically get water in them, and we'd have to wait for them to dry out before they'd be more reliable. And we had chaotic messes like this to deal with when something went wrong or someone bumped into something in the basement and knocked a wire loose. So we really wanted to get rid of the pager systems. Um, the top three questions I get at this point are, why build something and why not use a service? Um, we had a good look, and none of the services that were available to us could meet our SLAs. Uh, we have 15-minute response times for all of our customers, except for a few. And they really mean it when they want that 15-minute response time. Um, which I get into a bit here. Why couldn't we use SMS or something? Well, we actually do work for the um, major telcos in the country, which meant that we couldn't actually use the SMS network or the phone network, because if that goes down and we're trying to send messages about it, telling us things, then you know our messages aren't getting through, we're not finding out, and it becomes a whole thing in the media. Um, we also wanted to be able to prove that the pager person got the message without it being painful for the on-call person, so we didn't want them to have to go and, oh, I got a text message, I'm going to go tell a system that I got it. And we wanted the ability for um, things to work in places where the pager network couldn't. <coughs> All right. um, why not go staffed 24-7? Well, we had a very brief conversation about it, and everyone in the team decided it was a terrible idea. Um, people have families, lives, they don't want to suddenly be doing a business hour shift and then a night shift and then a morning shift. Um, we wanted to get to a point where being on call was less of a hassle than it was at the moment and where you could actually sleep through the week, um, which you now can 99% of the time. We also had a few other motivations. Um, so we wanted something that was open source because we're the largest open source company in New Zealand, so it's what we believe in, it's what we want, and it's what we try to talk everyone else into doing. Uh, we wanted to stop sending our customer data in plain text. Uh, for anyone unfamiliar with pager networks, the messages are in no way encrypted, and anyone who's got about $25 New Zealand to spend, which is about two to one euros um, in your favor, can um, get the equipment to read them very easily. Um, as the UK is finding out very recently for strange reasons. And more importantly, we thought we actually had time to find a proper replacement system. Um, so we'd spent a long time looking at options 
and then our hand was somewhat forced. Um, so Spark are the one of the two main telcos in the country when I was originally building Hot Potato. There's now a third one, but it was one of two, and they were the only ones who offered a pager network, and they decided in 2015 that they were going to turn it off. Um, before they turned it off, they said that the use of pages had declined 65% between 2013 and 2015, and that the service was now uneconomic. But that's fine. They had announced a window for when they were going to turn the network off. We were a customer. We thought we had time to find a replacement. And at first, it was largely good news. We thought we had a great opportunity to get rid of some aging technology, like the modems. And we had a great time reading some of the news coverage um, such as the National Business Review's dig at the drug dealing community, who apparently still enjoyed pages along with the emergency services. Unfortunately, it was too good to be true, and the pager network very quickly became unreliable. Um, pager messages started getting cut off. The server called a singer from a particular client, and that's the end of the message. So something in a server named a singer broke. There's about four of them that had that name at the time. It was a bit problematic. Um, so there was a large amount of press coverage of the whole pager network shutdown because it was impacting all the emergency services. Um, the Spark were quite clear and had said that they'd talked to all their customers, including, say, the New Zealand Fire Service, who were the biggest user. They used it to have all their volunteers had pages as well, because we have quite a rural community. So they would get pager messages and they would go get in the fire truck and go out and deal with the fire and that kind of thing. Um, it was a bit of mixed signals. The fire service quite quickly came out and said, we had no idea, what are you talking about? We're not sure how we would cope with that going away. Um, they effectively delayed Spark's ability to turn off the pager network, which was both good for us and bad for us, because um, the network became more and more unreliable. Um, but they had, the fire service had 11,000 volunteers in New Zealand with pagers who got notifications for their local area. So. It was quite a big system that had a lot of users and needed a bit more investment than Spark were willing to provide at the time. Unfortunately for us, uh, time ran out in the middle of the night. Um, one of our on-call people woke up to a customer complaining that we hadn't responded to something within our SLA window um, by a phone. And because we were getting no carrier to the modem banks that we dial into to send the pager messages. Uh, we spent a significant amount of time, roughly two or three days, talking to um, Spark's help desk, trying to figure out what was going on. Uh, for anyone who can't read that, that says, thank you for your patience. At this time, there are several calls waiting ahead of you. If people in your family tend to live a long time, please continue to hold. So after about two and a half, three days, we got in contact with someone who could actually help us, and they told us that People who hadn't already signed up to the new network that they had agreed to build with the fire service, which was essentially just the fire service buying the old network and then maintaining it a bit longer, um, that they had decided to disconnect people who hadn't started the transition. Unfortunately, it turns out they didn't actually have a complete list of all the customers who had been paying them money for many, many years, and we happened to not be on that list. So they cut us off in the middle of the night. Um, they had been working with people, but again, they hadn't worked with us. We had no idea. But they built a new API instead of using the modems to reduce their costs. Um, they had four or five different data centers around the country with a full rack of modems, and they were using a lot of power, and rack space is expensive, and they wanted to turn them off and get rid of them. So they contracted the company to build an API that people could use to send messages. Unfortunately, it took us three days to find that out, and it was after they turned all the old access points off. Um, this is a convenient photo of a phone system in New Zealand. Um, not, unfortunately, a modem bank, but just the pots wiring. Um, so they turned off the modem banks. They left one running. And unfortunately, because they had no list of all the customers that was complete, the ones that they had managed to toll Tell moved over quite happily to the new API. And the old ones just had their modems sit there trying to send messages over and over and over again to a very small number of phone lines that were available. So they effectively caused a distributed denial of service attack on the what remained of the infrastructure. 
which meant we couldn't send messages. So three and a half days later, we got the uh, documentation for the new API. This is the header of the PDF. Um, and we started working to solve the immediate problem so people could sleep at night. We'd been having people stay up and watch monitoring systems so that they could see what was going on because we didn't really have a better way of getting things to them because, again, things were problematic for us. Uh, we ended up actually biting the bullet and using email to SMS, which was very unfortunate. Um, it caused more single points of failure than we already had, and everyone was very uncomfortable with it, and people would wake up in the middle of the night while they are on pager and just go and check everything was OK, which, as you can imagine, wasn't great. And that is effectively how Hot Potato was born. We decided that email was bad and that a project that we hadn't named yet was good. So one night I spent an hour and I built the first version of Hot Potato. Um, it was a really, really bad API. It was effect effectively just a page that a server could post to and that would submit a notification from a dodgy script that we'd rolled out to all the monitoring servers which just took the details from a single Renagios and threw them at that page. It would insert the notification into a database and then talk to the API and send it on. Uh, conveniently, this was the point where all our pager messages became consistent, which was really good, but it was unfortunately under a bit of sad circumstances. Um, we didn't do very good planning on that first hour of build because we just wanted to get something in, so we had a page where you could go and see the recent notifications, which just did that um, and dumped every single thing that was in the database onto a single page in a HTML table which very quickly got out of hand and bad. So we knew we needed to do something better as well. Uh, we also added a handover button, which effectively just sent a message to the pager person saying, hi, I'm James, I have the pager now, which solved our IRC problem as well. So we had a small win, but it was still not a very good system. Still more reliable than email. Um, it worked mostly, and it gave us the time and opportunity to do a lot better than what we had. So we came up with some goals. It was very important to us that anything that we did build didn't get in the way. We didn't want someone to get 200 notifications because something terrible happened like AWS Sydney in Australia fell over like it did that one time when I was on call. Um, so we, wanted, we really wanted to make it easy for people to be on call. It's very important. Um, we didn't want the horrors of inconsistent messages that were just arrays of things sent to things. And we wanted to enable alert reduction and let people sleep. Um, there was a period where being on call was quite painful. Um, this is the number of pages per day from the start of 2018 to June 2018, so the first six months of 2018. And as you can see, there are quite a lot of pages per day there. We also wanted to be able to survive natural hazards. Um, they're kind of a reality of building things in New Zealand. Uh, we have volcanoes. Uh, we're not just near the ring of fire, we're actually part of the ring of fire. Like the entire country is in the ring of fire. We have a number of volcanoes up and down the country. Because of the tectonic plates and things, we get earthquakes. Um, quite. Recently, we've had a number of fatal earthquakes. Uh, in February 2011, 185 people died in one in Christchurch. And then in June, one person died. And then in November 2016, two people died and another one in Kaikoura, which is quite close to Christchurch. Uh, these are the fault lines running up and down New Zealand, um, both islands on the left and the North Island on the top. Wellington being where I live and up through the center of the country. Um, in some of the recent earthquakes, there was quite significant damage to infrastructure around the country, um, which actually impacted IT systems and power and the ability for people to travel and communicate, which are all things we wanted to plan for. Um, this is a photo from down in the South Island taken by the New Zealand Air Force that showed the uh, rock falls over one of the major roads and train lines down to the South Island. So freight goes via ferry from the North Island down through this part to the major cities in the South Island. Uh, this is slightly zoomed in um, from where the tunnel comes out. So this is the train track after the earthquake. As you can see, it's moved quite significantly. Not really safe to put a train over anymore. 
And here's that again from a different angle, kind of showing just how far it moved. Um, this is a member of parliament standing in a break in the road down in Kaikoura after the earthquake. Um, just to give you an idea of how much the roading has moved and how it might be a little difficult for a person to get from A to B. And here's another photo with a bike for scale on some roading damage. Um, power infrastructure was quite significantly hit. This is some rural power lines down in Waiulu, or Waiau, I'm not too sure, frankly. Um, and naturally, after a big earthquake, when you're trying to get people to places to help, what you really need is another city to start flooding and also be experiencing some earthquake damage. Um, this is a photo from Wellington. The other photos are from the other island. Um, if you are particularly interested in what can happen to major infrastructure, uh, this is the Canterbury Television Building down in Christchurch, which 115 people died in when it collapsed in the February 2011 Christchurch earthquake. Um, I'm not going to show photos of what happened to it after because it's quite distressing for people. Um, but as I was saying with the flooding, um, naturally while um, people were doing search and rescue in this building trying to get survivors out, um, they had the Japanese urban search and rescue team helping and then the earthquake and tsunami in Japan happened and they got recalled home. So it's very hard to get people to places and to help with things and everything that can go wrong will go wrong, which is what we wanted to plan for. Uh, we also have the ongoing risk of tsunamis from the earthquakes and things. Um, this is Wellington's tsunami zone. As you can maybe see, it covers the airport entirely. The airport is just above sea level. Um, this is zoomed in a bit on the main CBD area of Wellington. And then slightly further, we have the street that the Catalyst office is on. And that's where the Catalyst office is. So we're just outside where they predict the worst case tsunami will hit. But it's literally a meter from the front door of the building, so I'm, you know. We also wanted to survive any loss of international connectivity. Um, we used to have one main undersea cable with two, label, uh, two landings. And we're quite a significant distance from other countries. Um, our closest neighbor that would have the resources to really help us in a large-scale disaster as Australia, and that's a three or four hour plane right away. So by the time any real help would really get to us, it would probably be at least a day. And as you can see, to Europe, it's 24 hours, and other places, it's 11 to 12. Uh, it took me 32 and a half hours of flying to get to Heathrow Airport before I, while I was on the way here, so it's a significant amount of time. Um, so we had the one main cable, which went between Australia and New Zealand and New Zealand and the United States. Um, it had two landing points, which were both at the top of the country, which naturally, where we are, the fault lines go right through. So in the event of a major earthquake, that's probably gone. So we needed to be able to survive that as well. Uh, thankfully, things have improved slightly since then, and we have a number of other cables now. But they're all still landing mostly at the top of the country, as you'd expect. It's cheaper that way. Um, so we had some requirements. We wanted to survive disasters and team lunches. Uh, we wanted to support all of our existing monitoring systems. We really wanted to get email out of the picture entirely. Um, we don't want any of that in our delivery path. Email's just problematic if you're wondering why. I'm happy to rant at you about it for hours and hours after this. And we really wanted the ability to confirm message delivery. Um, so we wanted to move away from paging and our emergency use of SMS to actual push notifications that had both the cell phone networks and the broadband networks with Wi-Fi and things to make sure they got to people's phones. And then we get a nice confirmation back saying, hey, the message is on the phone. And later, hey, the person has read the message on the phone. We also wanted to do some improvements to the handover. Uh, which we had started on in that initial version, but people like going to sleep, and we didn't want people to have to wake up to do handover or have handover done. So if you've been awake all night and you're trying to sleep and the business day starts and someone else comes and they take over the pager, traditionally you would get a pager message yourself and you'd get woken up or you'd have to wake up and talk to the person. We wanted to get rid of that. We like people being able to sleep through the night. We really, really wanted to get rid of pages. Um, for those of you who haven't seen the Black Mirror episode, Hated in the Nation, I highly recommend it. Best one. 
and thus we had a plan for hot potato. Um, and we've spent the last four and a half years incrementing over it and making it better. Uh, we released it at the start of last year for public consumption and we've done a lot of work with our design and user experience teams making it something that's very easy for someone who's been awake for a very long time to not make mistakes with and have a much better on-call experience. Um, part of that also involved us speaking to past employees and people at other companies who were speaking publicly about their experiences with burnout and coming off on-call systems uh, for medical reasons and so on. So we, we did everything we could to make it the best possible system. So what did we build? Well, we built a web application with an API in Python and Flask. Um, we chose Flask specifically for the database support uh, with CockroachDB. So it also has that in the back end, which is, for those of you who don't know it, it emulates Postgres, but it has magic underneath that allows like global replication and clustering and magic, essentially, uh, with RabbitMQ for message queuing. Um, our production environment has five nodes, um, three in New Zealand, one in Sydney, Australia, and one in California in the United States, um, mostly because that's where the international cables go at this point. And there's not really much point for us going further at the moment. Um, we figure in the event that all of the regions in New Zealand go offline, we probably don't really care about all our things being down. We're probably busy trying to you know, put tarps on roofs and put tents up for us to sleep in. Um, so this is where our nodes are. The green one is the free New Zealand and the other two, the other places. All right. How does it work? So sending a notification, We have the monitoring server, which at the moment being traditional, a Singanagio style thing runs a script, and the script then does some magic to talk to Hot Potato. Um, we have a new version of this that we're planning to release soon, which instead of just trying to throw the message at the API repeatedly, does some proper queuing locally on the servers in the event that communications does go down. We have some customers who have very redundant internet and some that don't, and some that you know, may be on a small Pacific nation island and don't have the best communication at the best of times. Um, the API throws the message into the database and into the queue. And then we have notification agents on all the hot potato servers that just continuously poll the queue for new messages and try to send them to the notification providers. Um, we have worked some magic in so that we have both verifiable and unverifiable contact methods that people can load in. So you can say, have the um, pushover application on your phone, which counts as a verifiable one, because it will send back a, the person who's got the message. And then we have things like SMS, which doesn't have that verification. So if you have more than one set up and say the pushover fails, it will go through and try all the others and keep going with the ones that are verifiable until you've acknowledged the message. Uh, we also added in support for heartbeats um, after a few customer network problems. Heartbeats is essentially a script running on the monitoring server every minute, either executed by cron or the monitoring software itself, that just goes and tells Hot Potato it's alive. So how does it look? So we ended up with a user interface a bit like this. Um, you have notifications here that were all critical messages. They're all in a nice consistent format. You can do filtering and change by days, and so forth. Uh, and a particular zoomed-in example of a notification looks like this. So you have the demo server number four went down, the zone disconnected from a singer two at 1.15 p.m., and the message was sent to the on-call person. Uh, the on-call person would get a pushover notification like this one. And yeah, it works quite well. Uh, but what else can it do? There are other important things that we wanted things to be able to do. Um, so we added failure notifications. So we have a number of people, such as myself, who are escalation points for people who are on call. So if they're having problems or if they've been out for too long and they want someone else to take over, they can call one of those people. Um, in the event that you're on call and say you're not in your usual residence and your phone goes flat, um, the hot potato will recognize that it can no longer send you messages and it will start talking to people who have set up failure notifications for themselves, 
which are the escalation point people such as myself. So if, say, an imaginary person called Jason is on Pedro, his phone goes flat, it's not a big deal anymore because the other people will find out and get to go and deal with the thing and potentially try and reach Jason and say, hey, plug your phone into charge. Um, we have the heartbeats from the monitoring servers. Um, these are entirely configurable, which is quite nice, and you get uptime statistics. Um, this is very helpful if you, say, have remote customers with their own monitoring servers and their own networks and data centers who insist on sending all their notifications through proxy servers, and then they make changes to their proxy servers that break all but 33% of the requests. You find out quite quickly and you get to fix the problems and make sure that all your notifications get to people. Uh, we also recently added the concept of teams. Um, so teams in Hot Potato are quite cool. They're effectively just groups of people that can be on call. Uh, we have a number of teams at Catalyst, and there are a lot of people who look after their own servers, and then during the off hours, they would have them page us in the middle of the night. Um, one of the big things we've managed to do with alert reduction is convince those people that them getting the notifications during business hours or after hours is better for them and better for us. So we've effectively managed to put almost everyone in the company on call, or could put everyone in the company on call. Uh, the teams can also escalate. So conveniently, some of the teams don't want to be on call after hours, or they don't have the actual capacity to do so. Um, some teams are only two or three people. So we have the option for either all of those people get notifications during business hours, and then after hours they come to us, or they get them during business hours and nothing happens after hours, and so on. Uh, we also added some reporting. Um, so there's an interface that I'll show a bit later on that will give you some nice graphs and charts of things like how many messages happened in business hours, how many messages happened after our business hours, um, which customers monitoring servers which are the most popular for sending messages at the time. So you can easily say, well, that customer's been problematic at the moment, we should go look at their things. And then you get like a complete list of unique message counts. So if you had, say, five of the same server fill up with disk use at the same period in a week, you have that at the top of the list. And you can easily go, well, we need to fix that and reduce some alerts. Which helps with um, promoting alert reduction. Um, we added an API endpoint and built some hardware to put these little displays around the company. Um, it's some NeoPixel LEDs which rotate through colors and things and goes all the way up to nine at this point. We haven't made it to nine yet. I'm hopeful that we will someday. But that has been very useful for people coming down and going, ah, we went back to zero. What happened? What can we do to stop that happening again? It's been amazing for the on-call people. Um, just getting people in the company on board with reducing the number of things that go to on-call. Um, you may be wondering what notification providers it supports. So at the moment, we support Twilo for SMS, uh, Medica, which is a largely New Zealand-specific company, so yeah, and Pushover for Android and iOS notifications. Um, we've made it quite easy to add other providers for other countries, it, should you need to. Um, pushover notifications being the ones that look like that. And then inside the application, you can also have the option to acknowledge critical messages and send other messages such as handovers with a non-critical state so that they don't actually wake people up in the middle of the night or early in the morning, but they can see them on their phone when they do wake up. Uh, what have we got planned for the future? We wanted to do a mobile application um, because push alerts are amazing. Um, we want something simple, not very fancy, and with no learning curve for people. Um, again, to help promote other people being on call within the company and to remove third-party costs, such as pushover subscriptions. Uh, we want to do some magic with our support hotline, um, make customers do the right things and not end up with accidental telemarketer phone calls waking people up at 2 a.m. because they managed to dial the right number. Um, we also have some plans for a feature we're referring to as planned work, um, which is essentially having people giving the people the ability to have Hot Potato open on the computer while they're doing a large amount of planned work, say they're patching a production environment, um, and then using browser notifications to tell that person that something's about to page and give them a moment to say, ah, I just broke that and I forgot to downtime it. That's fine. And then the on-call person doesn't wake up. 
Uh, we've also been adding language support, um, so German and Italian are coming soon, which may or may not interest some people at this conference. Uh, you can currently enable this via the configuration file if you did want to have a look, or maybe help with the translations. Um, so what would you need to do to try it, or what would you need to do to deploy it to production? Uh, it's quite simple. We do all of our development in Docker, so if you wanted to, you can just run one command after cloning the repo and get everything up to play with. Or you could just build one server. If you don't need the weird amount of redundancy that we need, you don't have to have it. All right. Shall we do a demo? Or? Yeah, cool. All right. I conveniently have... Move that over there. Yep. Ah. See, that's me trying to be smart and getting the demo going too soon. There we go. All right. Um, so this is just a development environment on my laptop. I did have it running in AWS, but unfortunately I haven't been able to get a reliable connection to AWS, and I didn't really want to have that whole embarrassing demo not working thing go on. Um, if you are interested in seeing this under a live demo, I did do one last year at LinuxConf Australia and down in Christchurch um, with live demo over conference Wi-Fi, which was quite fun. But yeah, um, just get rid of that. So. Hot Potato user interface, nice and easy. There's three main options at the top. Um, the default team menu, where you can change to any other teams that you may be a member of, and where you can go and change your settings. Um, unfortunately, in this release, the search box is mildly broken, but we're working on that as part of um, putting in more back-end search features, such as using Elasticsearch for going for all the notifications rather than doing database queries. Um, that's what I get for cloning the current master branch. So this is the main UI. Um, this is loaded full of some example notifications, so I'm just going to pick the arbitrary last few months with. Um, we have a few examples here of the top one being a handover notification, where when I logged into this demo environment for the first time, I took over the pager. Um, an example critical notification, so you have the name of the service on that host with that trouble code. Um, trouble codes are an amazing thing we came up with, which is essentially just, well, someone else has probably come up with it as well, but a short little message that you can go and search for on a wiki and get step-by-step -step instructions on how to solve a thing, which when you have a large amount of different clients with different setups, makes things a lot easier for on-call people. would highly recommend that for anyone who doesn't do it already. Um, in Hot Potato, if you click those links, you can specify where they go. So if you have a wiki, you can say have pages with those name and just specify the URL and the configuration. Um, you can send messages to the on-call person. So if, say, they're out at lunch during business hours, you could send a message saying, hey, I'm just about to do this thing. If anything gets through, I'm sorry. I did my best. <coughs> First time patching this prod environment, you know. And Hot Potato can also do internal messaging um, when problems arise and so on and so forth. Um, we get messages for things being OK again, which are non-critical ones. So if things go critical in the middle of the night and you wake up, you won't get another storm of messages on your phone. If things go OK, your phone will just display them nicely. Um, all right. So. In this example here, we have a few servers. Um, as you can see, some of the servers have missed heartbeats because they've never sent them because it's a demo environment. Um, we fully support timestamps, and everything is stored in UTC like it should be. And you can easily disable notifications from servers and things as well. Uh, the reporting stuff. So you can see in the last week the types of messages that have been sent. Um, being a demo environment is not particularly amazing. Business hours versus out of hours, which servers sent the messages, the number of alerts per day, and that's the count I was talking about. In this case, there's only been one, so it's a bit unfortunate. If we maybe go for a different week, though, it might be over better. 
No, worse. All right. Cool. Okay. Uh, let's do some things. I'm just going to do that. Move my mouse back over here and drag this window over. All right. So, second person. Ah. Again, trying to be smart with the demo. That's two. So at the moment, this person is on call, they're on pager, this person is currently on call. We can take over the pager from them, we can send them a nice message if we want to. You're now on call. Other person's taken over the pager. Um, from that point, notifications would go to the other person and not the original person, except for a notification saying that that person's now on pager. Uh, we also have the magic of teams. Uh, that didn't go very well. There we go. Uh, so, in administration over here, there's a number of teams with some very bad test data names. Um, teams will have a number of people in them, and you can have different roles. Um, you can also say, I want this team to escalate to the hot potato team. Um, it should wait 30 minutes for a thing not being actioned or acknowledged beforehand, if that's a thing that can happen in that environment. And you can have the never outside business hours or always escalation policy as well, which always after that escalation delay. Um, Being a demo environment, a lot of these settings are going to be disabled, but you have the verifiable contact methods and the unverifiable contact methods. In the event they were enabled, you would be able to go and add them. Uh, you can set your time zone, and people have the option of using 24-hour time, which was quite a good option for quite a few of our people. And you can see which teams you're in, and if you have particular rights, you can leave those teams or say, this is my main team which will be the one that comes up by default when you log in, and the rest you can pick from the list. All right. Um, if you are on a team that can be escalated to, so for example, we just added this one, you can then view all the things that happen inside that thing, ignoring that error that shouldn't be there. Yeah. All right. Um, unfortunately, I can't send any real notifications to this at the moment because the lack of reliable comms and yeah, I kind of lost access to the AWS account I had some monitoring service in as well, so a bit unfortunate. All right. uh, drag this back over here. Cool. All right. Um, Obligatory thank you to our contributors so far. Um, mostly from New Zealand. Um, Callum's now in Japan, a few other places. And um, another thank you to some of the team. And we recently held an open source academy at Catalyst, which is now, a, well, has been a yearly thing for some time, um, and where we get secondary school students to come in and do software development for real world open source projects. So. If anyone's particularly worried about what the entry level might be, it's quite easy. So that's my talk. Um, yeah. Thank you very oh, much. Sorry. If you're looking for me. Yeah, yeah you have the, the last say. Sorry? What did you want to? Uh, just if you're looking for me in the conference, I have the uh, sticker on the thing <laughs> to make it a bit easier. I unfortunately don't speak any German at all. Um, and I do have some of those stickers to give out if anyone's interested in doing the laptop montage. Um, any questions? <coughs> yeah. um, at the moment, no. Um, we are planning some greater integration there at the moment. Um, we really want to do that kind of thing, but at the moment, not so much. Um, you can tag notifications with specific things. So, for example, we've set up some tags in production for um, 
like things that paged outside of their SLA and um, upstream provider events and that kind of thing, but it's probably not quite what you're getting at. Do you have any uh, planned uh, development to support Prometheus Alert Manager as a source of alerts? Yes, uh, we're actively working towards that at the moment. Um, there were a few more. Um, is it possible um, if you one uh, one guy in a team uh, you created and um, to activate the pager option, the active one to multiple person? Um, yeah, we are planning for that. Um, you can do it in the teams now um, for everyone during business hours gets the notifications, but we haven't made that a twenty four seven available everywhere feature yet because you probably don't want a team of say five people all getting woken up at two a.m kind of thing, but yeah. Yeah, might be there. Yeah. Someone wants. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I actually got two questions. One is a hardware more, and the other is more a software question. Mm -hmm. um, the software one, um, did you consider XMPP uh, solution as a something like a message delivery confirmation? And the second question, mm -hmm. um, you said you didn't want to use the provider network you're supposed to monitor, yeah. but then again, you're still using a different provider monitor to push out the messages. Wouldn't that be like, again, on the point of failure? Yes. Um, so first question, um, we did look at various options. Um, we looked at XMPP, we looked at Signal and a number of other things. Uh, in the end, we decided on Pushover because it was the most reliable one in our testing. Um, we would always be open to, you can easily add other providers and use them if you so desire. Um, we didn't really want to have to deal with setting up any more HA systems than just the database, which thankfully CockroachDB made quite easy. Um, on the second front, um, using different providers has been um, a bit of a source of pain for various arguments on the team. Um, we had, for example, we run a cloud in New Zealand um, because there's no local AWS or Azure presence. Uh, we run an OpenStack one. And the um, the Medica people moved their pager endpoint services onto our cloud. So we're trying to monitor our cloud for a thing and then send notifications back for our cloud, which, as you can imagine, may not always be the best of ideas. So we've had a number of discussions about making things like that better and using multiple providers, which is why we're planning to eventually go for the mobile app. Any more questions? Okay, I want to thank you again. Here you have a small present. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have another.